everybody, Wayne here. In today's Let's Play, I'll do a tutorial playthrough of Manila, The Savage Streets, 1945. Designed by Michael Ranella and co-published by Revolution Games and Take Game Designs. Manila is the second game in the Solitaire Area Movement series of games, coming on the heels of Stalingrad Advance of the Volga, 1942. I'll do a quick overview of the game, how everything works, and then we'll dive into the playthrough. So for now, let's go down to the table. All right, so in early 1945, the Americans had landed in the Philippines, had landed specifically on the island of Luzon, which is where the city of Manila is located. And MacArthur swore he would return, swore he would liberate the Philippines, liberate Luzon, and that's what he set out to do. So this game will serve to simulate that sort of final invasion and final attack upon Manila, the Battle for Manila. Um, battle for Manila was a hard-fought battle. Um, you know, some have called it the Stalingrad of the East. Um, it was heavy urban fighting. The Americans had not faced a lot of urban fighting yet. It had primarily been um, jungle fighting. You know, the island hopping campaign was in jungles. It was not in cities. So this was the, really the first time they faced that. Um, the Japanese defenders, they were outnumbered and they had very little mobility, very little heavy equipment. Um, but they were told to fight to the last man, and for the most part, that's what they did. Okay, so Manila is an area activation, area movement style of game. You're going to activate a certain area, all those troops within that area become active, and you're going to be able to move them, spending their movement points into either maneuvering them around or moving into adjacent areas where there are enemy units. These enemy units currently are unrevealed. You will go ahead and reveal the Japanese units. On the back side of them is going to be a special effect. So, first off, you look at the front, and there are three types. There's clear, urban, and fort, and they're also differentiated by color as well. Um, they're also differentiated by the terrain effect modifier in the bottom of each area. So, you can see, for example, um, Rosario Heights here, area 15. It is an urban area. It's gray. It has a plus three terrain effect modifier helping the defender. When you enter that area, you'll have one of these Japanese units. It'll be revealed. It's going to have a defense factor, and it's going to have a special ability. The special ability will resolve and will affect the very first combat. Um, if you don't defeat the Japanese unit and it stays around for follow-up combat, that special effect will no longer apply. You'll only focus on the defensive ability. Um, the game calls it the Japanese defense strategy. So, again, you have a defense number. Combined with the terrain effect modifier, overall that's likely to be the defender's strength. You will have a strength that is a variety of factors. We'll cover that when we get into the actual playthrough. Um, but with the special abilities, they're going to do different things that are always going to hurt you. Um, you know, something like the sniper. He actually eliminates your leader unit after the combat resolution. Whether you win or not, um, you're going to lose that leader. Um, an ambush is going to place the lead attacking unit, so during combat you pick a lead attacking unit, place them in the out of action box. Um, again, that is almost always going to happen. Um, and then something like Fnatic is, if its combat result is a success, it'll just change to a stalemate. There are two more types, and again, we will describe them as we encounter them. After you've eliminated the Japanese units, and hopefully you're able to do so, or else it's going to be a really short game, um, you will then place a control marker in that area, and there is a uh, marker on the record track over here, which you would then move up, or two of them, to show how many areas you control. I don't use them. Um, I think they're really fiddly, and you don't need them at all, because as soon as you eliminate a Japanese unit, you control an area. So any empty areas or areas that have your troops and no Japanese units are you are controlled by you, so I don't see a reason to keep track of them. Plus, some of these areas are small, and if you start stacking in the control markers, it gets a little fiddly, um, and they get a little crowded. So I just don't use them. But according to the rules, you should use them. So go ahead and use them, start off with, and see if you like them or not. Um, speaking of the rest of the board here, you know, each turn, besides the obvious, you know, maneuvering and conducting combat, you know, revealing units, there's a couple things to remember. Um, first off, we have the turn track up here, sequence of play. You have support units. So starting off, you're going to have artillery and engineers. There are optional rules for um, air support as well. Um, in addition, you can see there is the out-of-action box, available support units. So each turn, you're going to roll for supply. 
You're gonna see how much supply you get. You're gonna use supply to not only buy your support units, which get placed in available support units box, but you can take out of action units and put them back on the board. Um, finally, or second to last, I should say, is morale. Um, American morale starts high, but it will go down as the battle continues. You're suffering losses. You're engaging in tough urban fighting. That morale, when it's strong, gives you a plus one to your attack. If it gets to this other side, so it drops from the 19 to 9, you're going to flip it over. It actually gives a minus one um, or a plus one to the defender. Either way, it works out the same, right? It's going to hurt you. So you can spend supply to increase American morale. Finally, the random event table here. Every turn you're going to roll for random events. There's going to be things like um, taking units off the map short, uh, for a short period of time. It's going to cause divisional pauses of your three divisions that are on the map here. Um, you're going to have to deal with civilians and refugees or possible breakout um, by the Japanese defenders. So I think that is it for... The overview, the only other thing I'll say is victory conditions. So there's two ways to win. There's an automatic victory, which is if you control every single area on the map. And the second one, the operational victory, which is considered the historical result, is you control Intramuros over here on the coast. And then 33 other areas, there are 37 total. So you're, there's only going to be three left that are controlled by the Japanese. Okay, that should be it for the overview now. Let's go ahead into the playthrough. Um, we're going to see how combat works, activation, entire sequence of play, all that good stuff. Um, and you guys can see if you like the game or not. So let's get to the playthrough. All right, so first turn here. I have it all set up. Um, you can see we have our American forces on the outskirts of Manila. Um, we have the 37th Infantry. Several stacks of units here in Area 1, Calucan, over here in Area 2, and, oh, they should not be over there, they should be in Area 2. Um, in Area 2 here, we have the 1st Cav, they got excited, their 1st Cav, they're ready to roll, baby. Um, in Area 2, Grace Park Airfield, and then down here in Area 30, the bottom left, San Rafael, you have the um, 11th Airborne. Um, each turn, right, we're going to have... The sequence plays over here. Dawn phase, there's going to be reinforcements that possibly happen. Turn one, there's no reinforcements. Turn two, there will be. Permanent withdrawal, that would be later on in turn six. We're going to have some units, we're going to gain some reinforcements, and we're going to have some that leave the map. Um, you can check for leader mortality, which is any units that are out of action, that were placed in the out of action box the previous turn. You're going to roll a 1d6 to determine are they KIA, are they lightly wounded, they're going to return to play later, or are they going to return to play immediately. You'll have the random event phase. You have this chart here. Handily, the numbers are written on there. Um, possible random events. We'll get into them as we play. Supply phase, you're going to roll for supply each turn, 4d6. First turn exception, you do get 12 minimum. Um, then we're going to have the combat phase, which we'll cover that when we actually play. And after that, the end phase, we check for, if you haven't had the automatic victory, you check for the operational victory. Otherwise, you flip spent units back to the fresh side, reduce morale by one, remove that random event marker, and you advance the turn marker. So... Okay, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and dive in, start playing here. So turn one, um, it is February 6th through 8th, 1945. The battle for Manila begins. Um, again, we're in the dawn phase. First off, reinforcements, there are none, not till turn two. Permanent withdrawal, not till turn six, so no worries. And leader mortality, we haven't played yet, so no leaders in the out of action box. Don't worry, it'll happen eventually. Random event phase, roll 3d6, I like to roll the Japanese dice for this. And again, these are, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it, these are my dice, not the dice that come with the game. Dice that come with the game are red and green, so you do get that. But my flag dice here, these are DBG's nation dice that I'm using. So anyway, 3d6. All right, 4, 4, 2, so that's a 10. Check our little chart here. 10 is civilians and refugees. So we'll have to deal with civilians and refugees. So obviously, um, the... This battle, battle for uh, battle for Manila, excuse me, had even more civilian casualties than Battle Stalingrad, significantly more, in fact. Um, so we'll go ahead and place that over here. What this will do is when I conduct a mandatory attack, which a mandatory attack is me moving into an area where there is no Japanese defender, um, I will actually suffer a minus one on my attack. So, yeah, I think that'll cover that. Um, Okay, so that's it for the random event phase. Let's go to the supply phase. We're going to roll 4d6 to determine what supply we get. And again, on the first turn, we'll we treat anything less than a 12 as 12. 
but in the future, if you roll poorly, that is what it is. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Yeah, we got 12 exactly. Too bad. You always want to get more than that. I always want to get the max you can get, right? Oh, well. All right, so with 12 supply, we spend them now. They can be banked from turn to turn, um, but we have no support units. We definitely want some, especially for our initial push here, initial thrust into Manila. So let's go ahead and buy some. So let's buy a couple engineers. They are two each. And depending on the support unit, engineers provide a plus two to the American attack value. Um, the artillery provide a plus one. So that was four, right? Made of what, 12? So that drops us to eight. And let's go ahead and buy eight artillery, because artillery are one each. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In the future, we'll have to worry about out of action units. We have to purchase them back, or well, you don't have to, but you probably want to. All right. So for supply phase, we're on to the combat phase. Look, moving fast. All right, combat phase, right? That's the meat, potatoes, that is the bones of the game. Um, first off, you would check for bloody streets, which is any of the fort or urban areas that are contested, which contested basically just means there are Japanese and American units in that same area. Um, you would then roll for the bloody streets. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that. So now we conduct the action rounds. Action rounds are simple. This is where you will activate an area that has fresh units. You can activate whatever fresh units you want in that area. So I can say, all right, which I'm going to do here, activate area one, Cal Clan, and I'm gonna activate this stack of fresh units. And you can kind of assign them as you want, do what you want with your units. Just remember, you want a good mix. You can get a combined arms bonus. So in this case, this stack, right, is infantry, it is armor, and it's a leader headquarters unit. Um, combine those combined with either artillery or engineer support provide a combined arms bonus during your attack. Don't worry, we'll cover all that in a second. Um, and also you have to remember that these areas, one, two, and three, or excuse me, 30, have unlimited stacking. However, once you get into every other area, the stacking is six American units. Um, leader units do not count. So technically you can include more, you can include less, whatever, just up to six units. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do, like I said, I'm gonna activate area one, which is what I am gonna do. And this sort of group of units here, I'm gonna, act, I'm gonna activate them. Um, you can move them, you're supposed to move them one at a time. I'm gonna go ahead and move them into area 10, Kokomo Island here, adjacent. Go ahead and start moving them in. And movement, very simple. Obviously, you know, right, with uh, combat factor on the left, movement factor on the right, very standard. Um, different movement costs for different moving in different areas. A lot of this game is going to be kind of moving from one adjacent area into the next and then fighting, 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 right? So a lot of that, you know, that vicious urban combat. So you're not going to have a lot of like vast maneuvering. It can happen, but you know, just be mindful of that. But most of the, it's going to be a slog fest um, maneuvering from area to area and fighting every time. Okay. So we move the rest of them in. So we're going to have a combat here. So um, you do reveal, I know some questions with Stalingrad, the first game in the series about like the uh, revealing, when to reveal, I, I knew I knew how to play it, so I knew that's how you're supposed to do it, but you always reveal the Japanese unit first. Okay, so we have a Fnatic here. Um, Fnatic is his right defense strategy. With Fnatic, if a combat result is a success, it is changed to a stalemate. Ignore if the combat result was repulse, stalemate, or overrun. So, um, you know, it, hopefully we get a success, right? I'd rather bat than a repulse, but... Uh, or we can get an overrun, which can change that and then actually overrun him. So we'll see what happens here. All right. So we revealed him. We know what his strength is. Now we can go ahead and conduct our combat here. It is mandatory, so we have to conduct combat, but we were going to anyway. All right. First off, you designate the lead attacking unit. That's the one that relies on its strength the most. It also can be the potential target, although in this case with the Fnatic, it won't be. Um... So we have a, a, I'm going to pick the armored unit because of his six attack, because that's the highest, so I want that. So six. Now we get to place any support markers into the area. Now, I think there were some people who had questions, hey, you know, support markers, when do you place them? You do place them after you reveal, so you do know the Japanese strength before you pl place them. If you want, I believe there's an optional rule where you place artillery and engineer support before you reveal the Japanese unit, but I'm playing base game rules, so we do it after. I want to overwhelm him because I want to get that overrun result. So I'm going to pick an engineer. I'm going to pick two artillery. I'm going to really pile it on here for this battle. You can pick as many support units as you have attacking units. All right. So it's going to be lead attacking unit with his attack factor, which is six, plus one for each additional attacking unit. So seven, eight, nine, ten. 
plus one for artillery, plus two for engineers, so 11, 12, 13, 14. If you have armor, infantry, and then support units, it's combined arms, that goes to 15. And then morale is strong, so that goes to 16. So our base attack value is 16. However, remember there's civilians and refugees during a mandatory combat, we'll reduce that 16 to a 15. Okay, now for the Japanese, it'll be his defense strength written on the counter, eight plus the train effect modifier, which is three, so it's 11. So his 11 versus my 15. So even with all the extra help I did, I'm only up by one, two, three, four. All right, dice are gonna have a big impact on this one. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's good for us, baby. All right, so Japanese defender first, two. So add two to his 11, so it becomes 13. I got six, seven, eight, nine. So nine to my 15 becomes 24. Difference is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. The difference between them is 11. That means we got an overrun. So success would be attacker greater than defender. Overrun is the difference between the, the attack total and the defense total is greater than the defense factor of the Japanese unit, which is an eight. Which, with that overrun, um, we get to nullify that fanatic, which is we're changing to a uh, stalemate, remember? We get to nullify that. We get to go ahead and just kick his butt, overrun him, and he is removed from the map. Let's remove these support markers. They are used up. You can always buy them back in future turns, assuming we have the supply. And then the cool thing about an overrun is um, the attacking units actually remain fresh and they can be activated again in a future action round. Also, now that we've eliminated a Japanese unit out of the area 10 here, if we were playing with the markers, the American uh, control markers, we would place one in that area and we would adjust the track. But again, it's not necessary because every area is either American or Japanese controlled. If Japanese units are in an area with American units, it's contested. And once they're eliminated, it's now American controlled which means empty areas then you've moved out of are still American controlled. So you don't need the markers. All right, let's go ahead and, and we can do whatever we want here. Let's go ahead and activate area one again. Um, let's get, yep, let's get these units here moving into area nine, right adjacent, May Pajo. Move them in and just kind of put them out here so we can see there. Some of the area is a little small, but it is what it is. Okay. All right, it's going to be a mandatory combat. Let's go ahead and reveal. Ambush, oh no. Ambush is you place the lead attacking unit in the out of action box after combat resolution. The only time you ignore it is if the combat result is a repulse. So if you're repulsed, you don't eliminate them, otherwise you do. Okay, let's go ahead and conduct our combat. We definitely gonna do the same thing though. So we're gonna have the armor lead attack. Let's see, or should we do an infantry? Mm, no, we'll do the armor six and then we'll go ahead and combine or we'll send in a couple artillery a couple artillery here all right so let's figure out the attack total here um six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen for combined arms fourteen for morale be fourteen minus one for civilians and refugees and the defender is seven plus three so a total of ten All right, let's roll. All right, three, four for the Japanese defender, so it becomes 14. We rolled an 11, so ours becomes 24. So we absolutely crushed him. We actually overrun him, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Yep, so 10 greater than the seven of him, so he's actually overrun. Unfortunately, the ambush still happens, so the lead attacking unit is still placed in the out of action box. But at least we overran them. <laughs> Artillery this goes in your support box. And here we go. So stand by here. So they lost their armor. They're leading the way. So eh, we'll see if they continue. I'm guessing probably not without their armor. But we'll find out. Um, let's go ahead and let's see here. Let's activate area 10. Yeah, let's activate area 10. Um, those units fought, but remember they're fresh because they had an overrun in their combat. So let's go ahead and activate area 10 again. We will move them to area 11, San Nicholas here. I start sending them in. And we will reveal 
the Urban Defender here. Elite. Oh, Japanese side rolls 3d6 instead of 2d6 during combat resolution, dropping the lowest. Yikes. Okay. Um, well, we're definitely going to have our combat here. Let's commit an engineer. Well, no, no engineer. Let's just do a couple artillery. Yeah, let's, let's hope for our best here. Actually, no, because he's got... Let's do the engineer as well, because he's got that extra die roll. Okay, so... Again, our attacking strength is going to be 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 for combined arms, 16 for morale, but then minus 1 for civilians and refugees. And the Japanese defender, 7 plus 3 is 10. All right, so we have a nice advantage here, but remember, he gets to roll 3 and drop the lowest because of the elite status. So he drops that 1. So he gets three, four, five, five combined with his becomes 15. So I'm going to win the combat. Three, four, five, 15 becomes 20. Okay, 20 to 15. So I do win. I have as a success. Um, all attacking units, though, at this point, so he, el he eliminated a course, um, but all attacking units are flipped to their spent side. This had two good combats, eliminated. Bunch of Japanese defenders are all dug in and they captured two areas. We are well on our way towards ultimate victory. Yeah, right. We'll see. Okay, so captured, beautiful. Um, so like I said, even without the, Jap the American control marker, like this area, because it's vacant, that means it's American control. The rules even state that, so no need for a control marker in my mind. Okay, we have some support units left and we definitely wanna keep fighting here. So let's go ahead and send Activate area two here, and we'll send this group of units, start sending them in to area six here, San Francisco Del Monte Estate. Very good group of units here. Um, looking at it, well, let's go ahead and use an artillery for sure. So we'll reveal anyway, no matter what. Let's see, sniper, oh, sniper. So the sniper targets the leader. Um, after combat resolution. So, all right, let's go ahead and put artillery here. So let's go ahead and have our fight. We'll choose this uh, armor as the lead unit. So seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, combined arms, 13 and 14 for morale. 14 minus one for civilians and refugees. And the Japanese defender is seven, eight, nine, 10. So 10 versus 13, ooh, kind of close. Let's see what happens though. All right, four, five, six for the defender. So he goes up to 16. We got five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine plus our 13. 21, right? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 22. Ah, good at math. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, the difference is six, not more than the defender. So we don't get a, uh, we don't get an overrun, but we did defeat him. Artillery support out of here. So he is defeated. However, remember the sniper special ability is place one leader unit in the out of action box after combat resolution. Um, so unfortunately, Hoffman here, you're going into the out of action box. And we're successful, so flip them over to spent. Oh my. All right, let's go ahead and let's send. These units here over to area three. Ballara. Yeah, let's do that. Sorry, I'm moving them in. And again, technically it's one unit at a time, but I don't think it really matters. Don't tell on me. Okay, let's reveal. A fanatic. Um, a fanatic is, yep, if the combat result is success, change it to a stalemate. Ignore if the combat result was repulsed, stalemate or overrun. Let's use our tiller, final artillery here. Hope for the best. And I'll choose this armor as lead attacker. So five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Combined arms makes it eleven. Twelve with morale. And then minus one for the civilians and refugees. Defender, thankfully, only has six, seven, eight. So not super strong. And these these clear areas are obviously a little weaker for the defender. Alright, let's roll. Ah. Send them. Let's roll on the let's roll the dice tower. Let's use the dice tower. All right, four, five for the defender. I see those snake eyes for me, unfortunately. Um, five for the defender, so he goes up to 13. 
and Snake Eyes is a 13. Boom, both 13. So, stalemate. Um, I'll take that over being repulsed, which he was the fanatic. Um, is, you know, a success change with stalemate. We got an actual stalemate. So, whew, all attack units are flipped to their spent side. And the Japanese unit stays there. So now we have, we're in, occupying the same area as that Japanese unit. Okay, well, let us, I'm going to activate area one, This these units in area one, these fresh units. Let's move them. So they're going to move to area two, which takes, um, entering a vacant area adjacent to any Japanese unit, takes two movement factors. So now they've spent two, so they have each have four left. So I can technically move into Santa Mesa State. Should I, though? That's kind of, it is kind of risky, but... Because uh, I have no support units. Let's do it. Let's let's push the limit. Why not? We're not going to win if we don't push it a little bit, right? So let's go ahead and spend the last for movement factor. Move into this area. And these will be our units. And reveal the Japanese unit. A barrage. Barrage is... Um, the American player must either place one attacking infantry or army unit in the out-of-action box prior to combat. Or flip all attacking units to spent and retreat them. Um, I don't want to lose any more units, so I'm going to go ahead and flip them to spent and retreat back to Grace Park Airfield. Um, that'll prevent me from having to lose units, because then also reducing that combat. There's just a lot of bad things that could happen, so let's go ahead and just retreat and consider our units spent. Okay, so looking at it right now, the only fresh units we have are down here in San Rafael, and then up here um, in Maypair. May Pajo, area nine. We're not. We're gonna. They're gonna stay in tight. They're not going anywhere. They are staying right there. So, um, possibly looking at down here. But so one thing, just rem remember, just keep in mind, area thirty here can actually reach area twenty-seven. If you look, follow the thick black lines. You can see right here <laughs> they meet up. I know it's a little subtle. It's a little tricky. I wish it was a little more clear. Um, I saw someone online talking about it, but it is technically possible. So just keep that in mind. You can move from thirty to twenty-seven. Um, right now I'm looking at it. I don't know if I want, I don't have any support units available. So if I send them in, yeah, I just don't know. Cause what would it be? Four, five, six, seven, and that's it. No support units. And then eight from that. So whatever Japanese unit is plus two, that's too risky. I can't, I gotta wait. I know I said I'd push it, but I feel like if I attack, I'm going to get repulsed. What do you guys think? Should I attack anyway? All right, whatever. I'll show you guys how to do this. Here's how you do this. So we're going to go ahead and move. Activate Area 30, San Rafael, and move from San Rafael to Area 27, William McKinley Reservation. And we'll move all these bad boys. And I'll show you guys how it's done. I'm just going to roll better. That's my goal here. Let's reveal. A sniper. Um, place one leader unit in the out-of-action box after combat resolution. Wonderful. But he has only a strength of four, so I have a chance. All right, this one's going to be a nice, easy one. Um, easy to resolve, anyway. Four, I'll pick him as a lead attacking unit. Four, five, six, seven. No combined arms. I do get morale, so that's eight. Eight minus one for civilians and refugees. And defender is four, five, six. Six, there's one below me. See, look, I already got an advantage. I just got to roll. Roll gooder. Boom, I think I did it. So three, four, five for the defender. Goes up to 11. And then I have six, seven, eight, nine. Nine plus seven, 16. Boom. One, two, three, four, five. And it's greater than, it's actually an overrun on the sniper, funny enough. Um, but it still ha his action still, or his uh, special effect still happens. So I lose um, Hagen, the leader. He goes out of action box. And the sniper here is defeated. And technically I don't flip this to spent because I had an overrun. So actually I'm still fresh, but I can guarantee I'm not attacking anymore with the poor 11th Airborne down here, but they did take Area 27, which is one nice thing because in turn two, um, the reinforcements can be placed in any combination of Area 30, um, 27, or 28. So technically by taking 27, it opens up the ability for the um, um, reinforcements just a little bit. Um, okay, that said, that's it. I am suspending <laughs> offensive operations for today. And this three days, we are done. Um, we're gonna go ahead and hold to the next turn. So we're done with the combat phase, go to the end phase. Um, obviously we did not have an automatic victory yet because that's controlling every area. Um, 
We don't have an operational victory yet either. The, the only do that at the end of turn nine. The game is played through nine turns. Um, so we flip all of our units, all of our spent units back to their fresh side. I won't make you watch me do, do that. Flip every one. Reduce morale by one. Uh-oh, going down. Um, remove any random event markers. So that's Invading Refugees. Let's go ahead and take that off the board. Um, and then we will advance the turn marker to turn two. Next turn, we're going to get reinforcements. We're going to resolve the uh, leaders here that are in the out-of-action box. We're going to get our supplies, hopefully buy back this armor unit, get everyone nice and fresh, ready for another round of vicious street fighting in Manila in 1945. So I'm going to stop the video here. Um, I am going to continue to play through in another video, part two. But for part one, I think just covering that first turn, you got to see most of the things in action. Obviously, you guys didn't see every random event or anything like that, but you got to see combat. You got to see me spend supplies. So you see how things are resolved. I talked about the movement, talked about um, victory conditions, all that good stuff. So this should be a good turn one tutorial, which is the same thing I did with Stalingrad. And then unlike Stalingrad, though, because I don't think I continued my playthrough, I plan to continue my playthrough in this game um, with a part two and play out the rest of the game. So hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial video. Um, if you made it this far, please, and you're not subscribed, I'd really appreciate the subscription. Just click the button. You don't have to watch every video. Just subscribe so that way it'll really help me, um, help my videos be seen by more people and help me get more great games to show off to you guys. So, all right, hope you enjoyed. Comment below. Until next time, everybody. Later.